There's a mantra in animation, especially within corporate productions. Story, story, story. The focus of a film, the point, as it were, according to this line of thinking, is story. Now that's a fine sentiment, but it invites a throng of questions. Who tells these stories? Is there a singular method for expressing a story, or at least a superior method? Is this a story? What's the role of the audience slash spectator? And wait, is this line of thinking even accurate? Do filmmakers even care about story? Is story all that important? I'd like to share some thoughts from one of my favorite little academic pieces and a foundational plank in contemporary film studies, which amongst other things, opens a conversation around story and cinema. So if you care about film, if you care about animation, if you care about story and its place in art, I invite you to join me in discussion of Tom Gunning's 1986 essay, Cinema of Attractions, Early Film, Its Spectator, and the Avant-Garde. This essay has been reprinted a lot and written about a lot. One source is the recent Animation Studies Reader published by Bloomsbury, which also features some other worthwhile pieces, including a surprisingly breezy essay by Paul Ward, some thoughts on theory practice relationships in animation studies, and I might talk more about this in the future. And it has several pieces on representation in animation. When Cinema of Attractions was first published, film studies was dominated by psychology, and of course, auteur theory held as much weight and probably more then than it does today. While Gunning's work does retain strong elements of psychology, as we'll see, the foundation of his project is material based. He begins by paraphrasing Fernand Leger's reaction to Abel Gantz's 1922 La Rue, the wheel if you happen to speak French and have no idea what I just tried to say. Leger suggested the potential of the new art did not lie in imitating the movements of nature or the mistaken path of its resemblance to theater but its power of making images seen. Gunning suggests this is the very thing which dominated early cinema, cinema prior to 1906. He labels this the cinema of attractions. The terminology was partially inspired by Sergei Eisenstein's frequent references to carnival attractions, but it was developed with the practical considerations of his colleague, Andre Gaudreau, who lamented the inadequacy of the French translation for the term early cinema. Gunning comes to this conclusion after doing a survey of the Library of Congress for all films produced through the early part of the 20th century. The results of this accounting demonstrated that prior to 1906-1907, cinema was dominated by actualities, not scripted fictional films. This adds dimension to the discussion of early cinema and cinema in general. Gunning writes, the history of early cinema, like the history of cinema generally, has been written and theorized under the hegemony of narrative films. Early filmmakers like Smith, Melier, Porter have been studied primarily from the viewpoint of their contribution to film as a storytelling medium, particularly the evolution of narrative editing. Although such approaches are not misguided, they are one-sided and potentially distort both the work of these filmmakers and the actual forces shaping cinema before 1906. He goes on to discuss the works of the Lumières and Millier. These early filmmakers are sometimes held up to represent two distinct modes of filmmaking. The Lumière with their cinematograph, placing the world within the viewer's reach through topicals and travelogues such as these representing the non-narrative or documentary, compared to George Maillet with his effects-laden script fantasies, representing the fable and narrative. Gunning, though, goes right to the primary source and quotes Maillet. As for the scenario, the fable or tale, I only consider it at the end. I can state the scenario constructed in this manner has no importance, since I use it as a pretext merely for the stage effects, the tricks, or a nicely arranged tableau. 
This supports the argument that Lumiere and Melier don't represent as much a dichotomy between narrative and non-narrative, but share a common approach to cinema, that they see cinema less as a way of telling stories and more as a way of presenting a series of views to an audience. Gunning suggests that these distinct filmmakers are united in what he calls a cinema of attractions. It's a pretty well-constructed argument. So he follows by saying that cinema of attractions doesn't disappear with the dominance of narrative cinema personified by D.W. Griffith, but goes underground to avant-garde film and becomes a component within narrative works. Here, I would argue that he's underplaying the prevalence of attraction after 1907, but I'll go into this in a bit. After presenting the material basis of his argument, Gunning then defines his terms, tracking back to Legere. Cinema of attractions, he says, is a cinema which centers on the ability to show something. This he contrasts with the post-1907 narrative cinema, which is voyeuristic in nature. The spectator is the central figure in this analysis. Centering the spectator and their mode of seeing is directly related to Laura Mulvey's 1973 essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, which, en route to establishing a gendered critique, parses three points of the gaze, or prisms of looking at cinema, between the actors, between the camera and the actor, and between the spectator to the screen. In Cinema of Attractions, the principal manner in which the spectator sees is to be shown by the performer, whereas in narrative cinema, the spectator is placed in a position of looking in, so here are some examples. In 1896's The Bride Returns, we see a bride undressing. A uh, content warning here, I guess, for erotica. Uh, now note how she's playing to the camera, despite how the husband is right there. She's undressing for the spectator and inviting the gaze. It's a direct glance into the camera. Contrast this to a striptease from 1986's Nine and a Half Weeks. Here the spectator is in no way implicated in the performance. The showing done to camera in The Bride Returns demonstrates the performer's awareness of the spectator. They engage in the act of showing, of explicitly wanting to be seen. Kim Bassinger engages only with the gaze of Mickey Rourke. Her performance is for him, Though the spectator may identify with Rourke or Bassinger and imagine themselves in that position, they are explicitly eavesdropping on the scene. We are a voyeur, both literally and figuratively peeking through blinds. The trick film, exemplified by Moliere, which was perhaps the dominant non-actuality film prior to 1906, is a series of displays in a similar fashion, exhibitions to the audience. Even in Moliere's famous Trip to the Moon, the threadbare story is only there in service of the special effects. Further material component to bolster Gunning's position is modes of exhibition. The exhibitor was often a showman presenting the films. In animation history, we have the great example of Windsor McKay's Gertie the Dinosaur. Screenings of this involved a real-life McKay appearing to interact with his animated dinosaur culminating in McKay walking off stage only to re-emerge on the screen alongside his drawings. The largest chain of screens was Hale's Tours, which were frequently dressed up as railway cars and features films shot from moving vehicles. Even close-ups were inserted not for narrative purposes, but for exhibitionist detail, like this close-up from 1906's The Gay Shoe Clerk. In what we consider narrative or continuity editing, which comes to dominate film in the post-1907 era, the close-up functions as a seamless shift of focal point for the spectator. We're not meant to notice the change of frame, but feel as though it's our natural way of observing. The close-up here is exhibitionist. It's a rupture from the narrative flow. I'd like to step a little outside of the text right now. Consider modes of exhibition. We've talked about Hale's tours and the vaudeville type shows where McKay screened. In some regards, the cinema itself was the attraction. 
people were interested in the show and the story was just something that maybe happened along the way. Whatever the movie was, whether it was J. Stuart Blackton or The Great Train Robbery or Boarding School Girls, that was secondary. The technology itself was the draw. Now, think about our relationship with technology and entertainment today. For a short time, pre-pandemic at least, VR cafes had a brief run of popularity. The allure was not necessarily content, though yes, many gamers would frequent them as a pricey video arcade, but the technology. Even the home-use headsets meant to be compatible with mobile phones were a technological attraction, not a narrative one. Novelty and technology play critical parts in our cultural relationship to art. Technology has often been a driving factor for creators of art. Microscopy and projection were factors in the Italian Renaissance. Printing has had multiple technological revolutions from lithography to silkscreen to 3D printing. Even the invention of the tin paint tube to replace pig bladders created portable paints allowing for easy plein air which contributed to the development of Impressionism. So we can go through dozens and dozens of examples like this. I don't think it's a stretch to assert that the technology of early film was both an inspiration to its creators as well as a significant draw to the audience. I'd like to reiterate that Gunning strongly asserts the cinema attractions is dominant in the early cinema and that narrative cinema becomes dominant in the following years. He recognizes that attractions play a role in many films, musicals, for example. He also cites the case of 1924's Ben-Hur, which actually advertised the times when the blockbusting attraction scenes occurred. Show up at 1029 if you want to see the Last Supper scene, etc., etc., etc. With the discussion of Ben-Hur, we begin to conflate cinema of attractions, or at least allow it to include, spectacle. That brings us back to the original set of questions. Story, 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 and what is important to filmgoers? Following Gunning's cue, let's use material reference to make a case. So we'll ask, what is the highest grossing film in history? As of this recording, according to IMDb's box office mojo, it's Avatar. Avatar was marketed as, reviewed as, widely discussed as a technological marvel. I don't think folks cared as much about the narrative and characters of Avatar as they did about the dope effects. Avengers Endgame may soon overtake Avatar as the box office champion. Now, let me pose this question. Would Avengers, or the Marvel movies in general, be as popular if they were all narrative-driven films? if it was, in fact, story, story, story. Transformers movies and Fast and Furious movies regularly top the box office, and this is in no way a slight to those works. They are legitimately, in the truest sense of the word, awesome. But are they story, story, story? They're fast-driving cars that sometimes turn into robots, and we love that. It's exciting to look at. It's visceral. It's a full sound and body experience. Now, I invite you to investigate your own responses to these films when you first saw them. What drew you in? Was it giant blue people in 3D? Fast cars and giant robots? Or is it something else? When you recall these works, what first comes to mind? Now, I'll concede using box office as a material gauge has drawbacks. There's a huge recency bias. There's also bias towards expensively produced and marketed films, and the more expensive to produce, the more money is put into the marketing. These works also tend to do well internationally, as we see some films such as Transformers A's of Extinction are produced with international box office in mind. See, please see Kevin Bealey's tremendous Transformers a pre-make for a thoroughly engrossing take on this. But none of these mitigations wipe away that it is, in fact, spectacle, 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 which drives box office performance and thus commercial filmmaking. To return to Tom Gunning and Cinema of Attractions, he again 
asserts that the radical heterogeny of early cinema is not antagonistic or irreconcilable with narrative cinema. Porter's The Great Train Robbery, for instance, looks both ways. Cinema has an ambiguous heritage, one which assembles elements from many arts and philosophies and ways of seeing. He says recent spectacle cinema has reaffirmed its roots in stimulus and carnival rides in what might be called the Spielberg Lucas Coppola cinema of effects. But effects are just tamed attractions. That's all for today. Thanks for making it this far, if you have made it this far. And even if you haven't, thanks for making it as far as you did. There's plenty more to say about this, and if you have thoughts, please share them in the comments, and please like, subscribe, share the video, all that kind of stuff. And a special thanks again goes out to Anne Beale for our tremendous, tremendous, excellent music, and more in the future. Bye.